So praise the Lord. I'm going to speak this morning on the subject of binding spirits and loosing spirits. This is uh, binding evil spirits and loosing the spirits of God. Some of you have heard the message before. It may be new to some. But for those who have heard it, it will be good to review. For those who have not heard it, it will be a real revelation and an understanding into a deeper walk with God. The business of binding and loosing spirits came to our understanding some, oh, a few years ago now, I guess it is, we've been walking in this truth, and it has been such a blessing. There are so many things that people come to me with problems about, especially concerning demonic problems, and say, what can I do about this situation, that situation? And a lot of times I look at them and I say, the best thing you can do, and at the same time, the uh, only thing you can do is to bind and loose. And it's wonderful that the remedy is the best thing you can do, and at the same time, it's the only thing you can do. Many things you can't do. Binding and loosing will work at any distance, and it is a tremendous step of authority for the believer. And once you move into this realm of authority, the devil will try his best to get you to forget it. There may be some listening to me now who have been in this realm and have kind of let it slip and said, oh, well, you know, I used to do that, but I've kind of slipped off. We have a booklet called Warfare Prayers, which uh, will help you get into it and give you some model prayers to go by. They're not to be repeated by rote necessarily. They just give you some guidelines to go by. And then we also have a little booklet pulled from the books called uh, Breaking Curses and Binding and Loosing, which will give you uh, a condensed version of Binding and Loosing, what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, when we first got into deliverance, people are always telling me, they say, well, we don't know much about it. You couldn't know much less than we did at Hegwish when we first began with binding and loosing because we didn't even know how to stop when we got started. We had to stay and stay all night a lot of times because uh, we had a tiger by the tail. We had him out of the cage, but we couldn't, we couldn't get rid of him and we had to wait till we got rid of him. So we just had to wear him out and sometimes we were pretty worn out before it was over too. Because as you remember, when we started in deliverance, we didn't even speak in tongues. Uh, that uh, may come as a shock to some, but uh, the Bible doesn't say that you have to do all these things. It just says you do what God says and He'll do what he, He'll do His thing. You start commanding demons to come out and they will, in Jesus' name, if you take your authority over them. Well, at any rate, we, uh, somebody came along one time after uh, many weeks or months into deliverance that we were in, and there's some here that can remember those days, and uh, they said, well, you can bind those things. That's in Matthew 18, 18, which says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Wow, what a relief. We began to get a little sleep. Up to then, you know, it was uh, once we started him up, once we got him on the run, we had to stay with him till we got him out. That's all we knew how to do. Now that we found a way where we could stop, bind him up, get the person that was in deliverance rest, get the workers rest, and come back with the work, everybody rested up and go after him again. And this was really great. This is a great step forward. So we began to bind the evil spirits that we dealt with, and we also found it effective in hindering their activity even while we were working with them. And we used this verse, uh, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And boy, that was a good verse. Of course, there was a Another part of that verse I noticed, it said, Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I didn't know what to do with that. Because I liked binding them, but I didn't care too much for the idea of loosing them. I was more interested in choking them down than letting them loose. That didn't appeal to me too much. Well, I didn't understand how that fit in the scheme of things, so we began to use the first part of the verse, and we bound them in Jesus' name. And, of course, the binding worked, and it will work for you. And that's good. And most people, most believers who know anything about, uh, I've talked to them across the country, and they say, I say, do you know about binding and loosing? And they're telling me about a problem. I said, do you know how to bind and loose? Oh, yes. I bind Satan every day. Well, I doubt that that does a whole lot of good. I mean, that's just like saying, uh, I bind the sun to keep it from rising, almost. I doubt that we can bind Satan. He's a pretty good-sized adversary in the first place. 
And besides that, if we just bind him, we're just kind of scattershotting. We need to get more specific and bind the agents through whom he works. He's off up in the heavenlies running his universe and directing it. He does this through principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, world rulers, kings, princes, thrones, dominions, all of those sort of things. And you remember Paul said, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with Satan. Did he? No, he didn't. He said, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but we do wrestle with principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, world rulers, kings, and princes. And so I think when you start binding, start binding on that level, and I think you'll get some results, and rather quickly. Now, the demonic world does not want the truth of binding and loosing to get out, that's for sure. And a lot of people, when they talk about binding and loosing, they're just talking about binding Satan. Oh yes, I bind Satan every day. I've seldom seen anybody who got much help that way. And then others have gone a little further and they say, well, I bind the demons every day. Now you're getting close. Now you start binding specific spirits. Then you're getting close to the heart of things and that will work. But you're only doing half of it, you see. That's good as far as it goes. It's just not the whole show. But we went along for months, I don't know, maybe years, and we were battling the enemy and successfully binding these spirits, hindering or choking off their activities to the place where people could get relief and help and even deliverance by using the binding powers that we had. And yet we pondered about uh, whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <clears throat> and then there came a day <clears throat> when I was studying and I ran across, I was reading a book on deliverance. It was a rather poor book so I won't even mention its name. It's not worth reading. But I read a lot of books that are not that good but I looked through them anyway. But the book did say one thing that was of value and this one thing was that the, they were talking about evil spirits and not the spirits of God although there were spirits of God. And for some reason, when I read it that day, that rang a bell in my mind. That's the only thing I remember about the book. The rest of it was really off the wall. But at any rate, that particular statement rang a bell in my mind, Spirits of God. And I remember that when I was in seminary, we asked the professor about the Spirits of God. Because they're mentioned, seven Spirits of God are mentioned uh, twice in Revelation around the throne. And then in Isaiah 11:2, it names seven spirits of God that go to and forth, uh, to and forth through the earth. And I began to wonder about the seven spirits of God again. Now, when we were in seminary, we asked the professor, and so he gave us a nice theological explanation that seven was the number of God and completeness, and so of course uh, everything was in sevens and the. The seven represent the completeness of the Holy Spirit. Well, that sounded pretty good. I didn't know any reason why it wasn't all right. It just didn't thrill me that much, but I put it away and never thought too much more about it. By the way, uh, back to this verse 18, when we found this whatever you bind on earth, we found that worked and that whatever you loose on earth, I didn't know what it meant. So I did what I learned many years ago as a baby Christian. Some older, wiser Christian told me, when you run across the scripture, you don't know what it means. Don't throw it away. Don't deny it. And don't worry yourself to death about it. But just tell the Lord, I believe this scripture. I have no idea what it means. I don't know because I don't know what it means. I can't apply it to my life. But I believe it because you said it, Father, and you've never said anything that wasn't right. And when I understand it as you want me to, I'll know how to apply it in my life and where it fits. In the meanwhile, I'm going to put it on in this cubby hole right here. I'm not going to throw it away. I'm just going to store it. And if you want me to use that scripture, you're going to have to show me what it means and how to use it, and then I'll do it. That's what I did to the last half of that 18th verse. That way I didn't have to sit around every day and wander and say, Oh, I can't go any further in my Bible study till I know what the last half of that verse is. I find people stalled out all over the country. Well, I was studying the Bible, you know, and then I struck this verse and I couldn't understand it, so I just quit. The devil would like nothing better than for you to stall out. Listen, there are things in this book that you and I will never understand till we get to heaven. 
but there are a lot of them that we're going to understand if we pursue God and if we'll just use what we have and keep on moving and ask the Lord for more. Haven't you found that to be true? But don't sit around and stall out on your scriptures trying to understand every jot and tittle. It's good to have an inquiring mind. It's better to have one that keeps moving. And you can come back to these puzzlers every once in a while and say, hey, Lord, you know, I'm still wondering about that verse. Exactly what that means. If you'd tell me what it meant, I sure would appreciate it. And one of these days, when it's time, he'll tell you. Now, we went along for months and didn't know what this last half of this verse was. And I remembered when I read this book and it triggered my mind, the spirits of God, there are spirits of God. I thought, I've been meaning to look that up sometime. For years, I thought I'd go and look that up sometime in the concourse. I never had. So I just went to the concordance, picked old Strong's up, and uh, when I get to have him, I'm going to hug old Augustus Strong's neck. He sure has saved me a lot of headaches and solved a lot of problems for me. I don't know how he kept from going crazy writing that thing, but uh, have you ever thought of how much work there is to that? My word, that man. At any rate, I looked it up in Strong's concordance, and the first thing when I looked up spirits, I was stunned at the number of scriptures that were in there that had to do with spirits. And they weren't all Holy Spirit. Why, well, they were all kinds of spirits. And I found funny spirits in there. I found spirits of peace, joy, long-suffering. I found all kinds of spirits. Spirits of, of singing, spirits of this, that, and the other that I never even thought about being in the scriptures. It's a long, long list in fine type. And I began to go through these scriptures. And I thought, boy, this, uh, you know, I was like a, a bird dog that's on the trail of some birds. I haven't seen them yet, but I've, I've heard the whir of their wings. I know they're around there somewhere. And I was getting excited. I felt like, Lord, I believe you're going to give us a breakthrough. I, I just sensed we were on the, was on the verge of coming to a breakthrough in deliverance to give us even more power over the enemy, more ability to defeat him, more ability to set people free, and above all, to teach them to set themselves and their friends free. And so finally, I landed over in 1 John 4.1 when I was running references. 1 John 4.1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see if they be of God. Now, I had read that verse, no telling how many times, when I was a baby Christian. Uh, because 1 John was one of my favorite books. I used to read and reread it. And uh, the, when I went through it, this time, though, it jumped at me. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, plural, to see if they be of God, these, these plural spirits. Now, if there was only a Holy Spirit and then a bunch of, a horde of evil spirits, when you ran across a spirit, when you knew it wasn't the Holy Spirit, all you do is cast it out. But he's not talking about that. He says, try them, check them to see if they be of God. In other words, there are evil spirits and there are spirits of God. I said, Lord, I need more than that. And so I kept running references and I finally ended up, I really hit pay dirt when I got to Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, again, a chapter I'd read and preached from many, many times. And yet this time, something strange happened. When I hit verse 7, it says, Speaking of God, who maketh his angels to be spirits. And I felt like I ought to receive the dumb, dumb award of the year. There it was in print, plain English. God makes his angels to be spirits. They are the spirits of God. Now, that may seem very elementary if you've been moving in this truth, but listen, it hit like a bombshell in my head. And I let, went on down to verse 14, including on another use of spirit, and it said, These angels, who are the spirits of God, shall be the ministering spirits for those who shall be the heirs of salvation. Are there any heirs of salvation here? Oh, yes. I'm an heir of God, joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm interested. When it speaks of heirs, I want to see what it's talking about, don't you? And it says, He makes His angels to be spirits, ministering spirits, for those 
who shall be the heirs of salvation. When that was written, I was one of those shall be's. I was down the road a piece, weren't you? Several hundred years. And now I find out that one part of my inheritance as a child of God, part of the thing that God has promised to me is that I have angels who will minister for me. The angels of God, the spirits of God will minister on my behalf. Now I knew from previous studies that one third of the angels of God at a time in the past had joined with Lucifer and the super angel and had fallen and been cursed by God and fell to the and were cast into the earth eventually. And that this is their particular habitation, the second heaven and the earth. And I knew this. And I always liked the fact that we had a two for one majority when we went to fight with the enemy because there were two of God's angels for every one of the evil spirits. That's a good majority in anybody's game, especially when the angels of God are armed with swords. And according to what our demonic friends, quote unquote, have complained about, they were disarmed when they fell. God removed their swords, and so they're no longer armed, and they are at a great disadvantage when they engage the spirits of God. Now, the angelic spirits of God, then, are ministering spirits for those who shall be the heirs of salvation. Now, of course, you immediately run into problems with people saying, hey, you can't fool around with angels. That's dangerous business. Now, I wonder who started that. Well, we don't want any angel worship. We certainly don't. But I'll tell you this, who had command on angels over angels when he was on earth? Did Jesus have it? Could he command angels? Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when that soldier took a swipe, uh, reached out and grabbed Jesus, and then Peter grabbed his sword and tried to chop his head off, and the guy ducked and he got his ear? You certainly didn't think he aimed for his ear, did you? And... Uh, Peter was a better shot than that. But at any rate, remember what Jesus told Peter is so significant. He said, put away your sword because if I had wanted to, I could have called the Father and what would have happened? He would have sent angels. So the, the Lord Jesus had command over angels. Did they minister to him? Remember in the Gethsemane, after the tremendous trial he went through where he almost died in the garden, and he prayed for strength to make it to the cross. Uh, you remember? It said angels came and ministered unto him. Now, Jesus had command over angels. Now, who did he give this command to when he left? He's at the right hand of the Father. Behold, I give you power, delegated authority, power of attorney, over all the delegated authority of the enemy over all the power of the enemy. And that power includes the authority to command angels. Now we never under any circumstances worship angels. Don't forget that. There's never any occasion to worship an angel of any rank. There's never any reason to pray to an angel. You say, well, I remember a few times, it seems to me like in the Old Testament, when men fell down before the angel of the Lord. Yes, and they were not rebuked for it. You know why? Because when that happened, that was Jesus before he ever, pre-incarnate. Pre means before incarnate in the flesh. Before he came in the flesh, he made appearances. The angel of the Lord was the one that wrestled with Joshua or was, uh, appeared with Joshua, took charge of the host. The angel of the Lord was the one that wrestled with Jacob. And you'll find the angel of the Lord making his appearance. And when he does, men will pay homage to him and not be rebuked. You remember Abraham fell down before some angels that came. They said, get up, we're just servants. The angels of God will not accept worship. And the other kind you don't want to fool with. Amen. I don't think that the devil's angels can't, I haven't forgotten how to dress up and look pretty. They can certainly look beautiful. And they will if that's what it takes to get you. But at any rate, 
we do not pray to angels, we do not worship angels, but we as believers have a power of attorney left to us by Jesus who came back from the grave saying, all power is given me in heaven and earth. That means we can call for these who are the ministering spirits, the ministering spirits for those who shall be heirs of salvation. I have power in Jesus' name to pray to the Father in Jesus' name for angels to come and minister to me or for me in whatever I need. Now that's a pretty wide scope, isn't it? You say, well, I don't know. I'd be a little afraid to do that. Well, then you won't ever get anything done. You've got to move off your do-nothing and begin to reach out and believe the promises of God if God is going to help you and do something for you. If he's going to help me, we've got to believe what he says. Now, we ran into this binding and loosing thing. And if you back up to the 16th chapter of Matthew, let me see, it's in... Um, Oh, in verse um, 19, you'll find out this binding and loosing is the keys to the kingdom. You hear a lot of talk about the keys to the kingdom. The Catholic Church doesn't have it. They never have had it. The keys to the kingdom are, are given to believers who take their authority to bind and loose. Now let's see what binding and loosing means bring it back to 1818 again, all of a sudden, verse 18 and Matthew 18 began to take on a new significance. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Now, I like that when we've been using that. Basically, all that verse means is, whatever you bind on earth, I'm down here on earth. In the name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of lust in me, in somebody else, or across the country, or in the heavenlies. See, angels can travel any direction. One reason they made, were made spirits, they can go down inside of you where the trouble is. Isn't that nice? You go to a deliverance preacher or a deliverance worker, they can't reach down your throat and pull the demon out by his heels. But an angel can go in there and get him. Hmm? Aren't you glad? You say, yeah, you got an awful big hand there. You may feel like somebody's reached down your throat when they start coming out, but the angels of the Lord can do what we cannot do. That's not the only reason God made them spirits. That's one reason, though. They go down inside where the spiritual problems exist. Now, whatever you bind on earth, I say in Jesus' name, Father, in Jesus' name, I bind this wicked spirit down here. So what does God do? The request is made on earth. It's bound in heaven. Heaven says, approved. Request approved. Stamped approved. And it goes through and instantly the binding takes place. I may not see it, but the spirit world recoils before it. All right? Now, look at the second part of it. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'm down here on earth again, still here, haven't gone to play any place. Whatever I loose on earth, Father, in Jesus' name, I want you to loose some angels, some spirits of God up there to go and minister to John over there. I want to send some spirits of encouragement, some spirits of consolation, some spirits of joy, some spirits of peace. Send them to him now in Jesus' name to help him out. Whatever I ask on earth, whatever I shall loose on earth, shall be loosed where? In heaven. I say, Father, would you loose those angels? And heaven says, approve. See, it comes through the right channels. You go to the Father in Jesus' name, and he releases those angels to go immediately to do it. Now they can go to China as quickly as they can go right here. You have to understand that time does not bind them. The space problem doesn't exist for them. Quicker than you can think, they're on the job doing what you requested in Jesus' name. It's part of the believer's inheritance 
to be able to bind evil spirits and to loose the spirits of God. Now this is a stupendous thing and we have not even yet plumbed the depths of all that this means, although we've been using it for months now. We have not yet come to an understanding of how much is involved, how much disaster happens in the spirit world when we use these weapons of our warfare by binding evil spirits and loosing the spirits of God. By the way, you can loose angels by the legion. There's only 6,000 in a legion, and God has millions and millions and millions of angels, so you're not going to deplete heaven. I mean, this is one time you don't have to be stingy. You can just launch enough to do the job. I mean, you don't have to be careful about this. You can just let them fly. And we've been doing this for a good long while, and the warfare prayers had gone out across the land. I guess there's 100,000 copies scattered through the land already. And people across the land were using these as models to go by to bind and loose for themselves, for their home, for their children, for their nation, for their business, and everything else, using these pattern prayers. And they'd been going on for a couple of years, I guess. And I had a demon cornered one time, and a rather high-ranking demon in another part of the country. And he looked at me with great hatred and he said, you've got to stop teaching binding and loosing. This is the most horrible thing you've ever done. He said, you've done a lot of terrible things, Worley, but this is one of the worst. This is one of the rottenest. <laughs> he said, we have not had this much trouble in centuries. You know why binding and loosing is so deadly? Because the average believer can pick it up and do it. It doesn't, you don't have to go and take a course in Bible school. You can just take a few simple verses and begin to move in your authority, and things will begin to happen within a week to two weeks. If it's a difficult case, it's, but you'll begin to start noticing changes. And if you are more persistent than the demons, you'll win. I find that believers are incredibly lazy, they give up. You know, on the plains of hesitation bleached the bones of millions who at the dawn of victory sat down to rest and while resting died. And I find a lot of believers bleaching their bones just when they were about to win. They say, well, I just got so tired of buying any loses, so I just quit. When we get to heaven, we're going to find out you probably quit just in the nick of time. The enemy was about to be smashed completely. My encouragement to you is to keep on binding, keep on loosing. It does an incredible amount of damage to the spirit world. There's no way we can even gauge the deadly inroads made by our being obedient and binding evil spirits and loosing the spirits of God. This demon told me that the plans of the Illuminati were now 10 years behind. They were falling behind, not at a chronological rate, but faster. Instead of falling behind a month in a month's time, they'd fall behind six months. And they said it was mainly because of binding and loosing. Binding and loosing. And you know, you remember that here in Hagwish we had prayed against the witches and the witchcraft things many months back. I just got a testimony out of a witch who was the second in command to um, LaVey, Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan. By the way, the Church of Satan is just window dressing. The depths of the wickedness that LaVey is in does not emerge in the Church of Satan. That is just mild compared to what he's really into. But this guy was the second honcho. Guess what? He's saved and he's in Peter's Church in New York right now. And he gave a rundown on a list of demons that will knock your eye out to prevail in the, the big high moguls. He also gave me a list of people who have been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit out of those high ranks. It's been working people. We thought maybe we hadn't made, done any good, but God's been snatching those people and saving them. And that's the best way to tear down somebody's operation, isn't it? Say, uh, take their leaders and change them over to your side? Hmm? God's a good strategist. And he's been raiding the fold of the enemy. So step up your binding and loosing concerning the witches and the warlocks. They want out. Many of them want out. 
They just don't think there's any possibility. Well, if they went to the average church, do you think they could find the way out? Knowing what they do about the demonic, knowing what they do about demonic activity, if a witch or a warlock were to go, or a Satanist were to go to the average fundamental Bible church thundering out against sin, well, now that person doesn't need convincing they're in sin. They already know that. But the ones that want out, can they find help there? They need help, and here they find them denying the fact of the supernatural, explaining it away, just imagination, superstition. They can't find help. Why? Because there's little faith in that church in the real verities of spiritual reality. Well, but they're coming out. And God is moving. Isn't that encouraging? So keep pressing on. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And this demon told me, he said, the Illuminati has been so messed up. The principalities that guide all the wicked movements of the New Age movement, the economic bloc, the political and the financial maneuverings and meanderings are guided by principalities and powers who work through thrones, dominions, and all of these other various step-downs. They issue orders and power going down through the channels to arrange the disaster and that gets down here. The bottom line is the human dupes like Rockefeller and the others who are highly demonized, who are running around doing their bidding, who are so demonized they don't even know what they're doing. But they're following the dictates of a master plan of Satan. But this demon said, things are in so much confusion because those stupid, simple-minded idiots across the country, they pick up that blankety-blank warfare thing every morning, hundreds of them, they pick it up. Here they go. Now, Lord, let me see. We bind in Jesus' name. We send legions into the principalities and powers. And they go right down the stupid list and said, here comes legion after legion of angels with chains coming and binding. And said, about time they get one flight, here they come from another direction. There's some more idiots busy. And they're just sending them from everywhere. The angels of God are coming. And they're throwing everything into confusion. So they bind them. They gag them. They put sacks on their heads. Said, it's disgusting. <laughs> said, not only that, they cut down all the communication lines. And the, and the runners, you might say, the spiritual runners that take the messages down to the earth. Can't get through. They're blocked and, and hamstrung and, and thrown down and hindered. And the principalities and powers are busy fighting off, trying to fight off these hordes of angels that come from those idiots. Saying, it's all your fault. You and those idiots that are teaching this, you've got to stop it. <laughs> you know something? You say, oh, you're just spinning dreams, you're just wandering. I don't think so. That demon was genuinely upset. Why would he be upset? If we were just spinning our wheels for nothing, why would he even bother to talk about it? Let them go ahead and waste their time. But it isn't a waste of time, that's it. We have found a secret, we have found a crack in the armor, and I'm convinced there are many, many more. Binding and loosing is only the beginning of opening up the whole spirit world so it can be attacked with all the power of Jesus Christ. The early church did it. When Paul wrote letters, what did he do first? He said, grace and peace to you. Why? Because they needed grace and peace to read those letters. They needed it in their daily lives, didn't they? And you'll find, he said, I pray that you'll have a spirit of understanding of what the will of God is. He's sending spirits. Read his epistles again. It's amazing. It's in there. They used, they used it just routinely. So what happened? The whole world exploded before them as they went. They went like huge bombs blowing apart whole cities. One small party would hit a large city like Ephesus and it would go into an uproar. In a matter of days, the whole city would be in an uproar. You can have a meeting in uh, a big metropolitan area now, and they won't even, most of the people never know you've been there. There's no uproar. Hmm? But you know why? Because they went binding and loosing. 
they went armed with this knowledge and understanding that God is bringing back into the church in full force. And that which has been seen dimly, if at all, in the past is coming into bold relief. It says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Those are positive promises. You can loose spirits into yourself. You can bind spirits in yourself. You can reach out and loose and bind spirits in other people. You can reach across the country. You can ask the angels to go and minister for you. Ministry covers a great deal of territory. You can send ministry angels ahead of you to that interview. You can send ministry angels to take care of a difficult situation that you're facing to create favor with you with the people that you need favor with. Will this solve all your problems? No, but it's certainly worth trying. Doesn't cost anything, does it? It's been paid for. You're only out the praying if it doesn't work. But what are, what's happening if it works? You're ahead, way ahead. And you're going to find out that this will work if you combine it with intelligent prayer and Bible study so that God can guide you into the places. He'll throw you into the forefront of the battle. And as you bind and loose, and as you send the spirits of God to others to bless them, to encourage them, the spirit of adoption to draw people to Christ, now, you know, after I got a hold of this thing, I brought it to the church, of course, and I was really steamed up about it, and I was excited, and I, I brought it and dropped it in my church's lap. And um, so uh, they were busy writing notes and everything. I think it was on a Thursday night, probably, when I shared it. The following Sunday morning, as I recall, we were in deliverance, and I was over here on this side, and there were people all over being delivered, and I heard a demon scream out right over in here, no, no, I'm not coming out. I will not. Well, that wasn't anything too unusual. I've heard that before. But about five minutes later, I heard that same demon holler out and said, now what did you have to do that for? Now I'm going to have to come out. Well, I'm always interested in that. That sounded good. So I just um, simply got somebody else to take my, cover me over there, and I slipped over here. Happened to be Dennis over here working on that thing. I said, Dennis, I said, what did you do to that thing to make it give up so quick? And he looked up at me like a, grinning like a goat eating briars. And he flipped his big old Bible open. He said, well, he said, you know, Pastor, after you preached that sermon, he said, I just went home and I got my concordance down and I wrote down all the references and to all the spirits in the concordance. I felt like telling him, shut up. I would have told you to do that. I'm the pastor. You're supposed to wait for me to tell you to do those things. But I didn't say anything. And, and he said, so I went down my list here when that demon wouldn't come out, and I, I just loosed burning destruction and judgment in him. Now, when I was looking for him, I never thought about that. But I would have. You understand, I would have. But he'd already latched on to it. Praise the Lord for people who search the scriptures to see if these things be so and learn how to put them in practice. I tell people when I go across the country in meetings, I tell them I got a church full of smart alecks. They always walking up to me and say, Pastor, you've probably already seen this scripture, but it sure did help get this demon out. And they read me a scripture and I feel like telling them, I would have thought of that. You're supposed to let me tell the people about all these good things. Now, I think it's a wonderful thing, testimony, that when people move into deliverance and into ministry, they begin to search the scriptures and God begins to unveil to them wonderful truths that they can share. We share with one another. That's why I keep saying all the time, there are no stars in deliverance. There's only workers. Some have been at it a little longer, but there's only workers. And everybody's in a growing process. And if you're not growing, well, just get started. All you have to do is kick her, kick her in gear and get on the way. So that's how we moved into binding and loosing. 
and it proved to be a tremendous asset both here at the church and across the country. And everywhere it's gone, it has worked miracle after miracle after miracle because the average person can do it. It's my joy to tell people across the country, you know, we got a lot of people saying, oh yes, oh, you've got a great ministry, I see it all. Oh yes, it's coming clear. Oh yes, Lord, yes, yes, I've got it. Oh yes, 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 sister. God's got a great ministry for you. You're going to go across the seas and carry this glorious message God's thrilling in your heart. The sister sits up. She never heard of anything like that in her life, you know. And uh, go sell your house, sell your car, give me half of it, go to Bible school. It's worth it all. I'm so sick of these religious racketeers going around the country fleecing God's people. May God grant us enlightened believers who will open their minds and shut their pocketbooks to these robbers. They're nothing but thieves and robbers. They're hustlers. They're religious hucksters. God does not finance his work that way. People going around and begging and pleading and got the hand out all the time. We don't raise money around here that way. Never been a pledge card signed here. Hmm? What good would a pledge card do? Just take up time and space in the file cabinet. If you're going to be honest with God, you'll be honest. If you won't, you won't. Signing a card's not going to make you any more honest. Huh? You ever go to one of these places where they have a wave offering? Whether they say they want a quiet offering, don't make any noise. Get that paper stuff that doesn't make any noise. Have a wave offering, put, put the money in your hand, wave it, you know, to the Lord. Now get it, ushers, quick, before they put it away. All this seed faith stuff is completely abomination. There's no scripture for that. You plant seed faith, you plant money for seed faith and somebody else will get it, I bet you. Where do you reckon that money went? Why, well, it's building the building. Huh? Better wake up. There's a lot of shenanigans going on in the religious world. A lot of fundraisers decide the religious field was a good place to operate. And a lot of religious people started out and they may have even had a vision in the beginning but they overstretched. They tried to enhance and make the vision come to pass. They got overstretched and they found out that friendly banks would loan them any amount of money. But then they found out the friendly banks also want a friendly payment every month. And so then they have all these bills to pay. So then they have to run and they have to use the fundraising squeeze. And they get bagathons and all this kind of stuff going on. I think I shall throw up if I hear another bagathon. I mean, it's bad enough when the secular people do it. But when people get on and advertise that poor old God's broke, help poor old God pay his TV bill. Why not let it go unpaid and clear the TV waves? Hmm? Some of it couldn't be worse. Binding and loosing is a tremendous weapon that God has put within our grasp. And go back to Matthew 18 again. Let me call attention to something else. The 18th verse talks about binding and evil spirits and loosing the spirits of God. The 19th verse is tied right to it. Again, I say unto you, if any two of you, which two? The two that have been binding and loosing. This promise is not for everyone. It's for those who are binding and loosing. If any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask. It shall be done of them by my Father which is in heaven. See why some people haven't been able to cash this check? They had nothing in the account. If you are a binder and a looser, you get to claim this. Verse 20 is also tied into the same verse. For where two or three who are binding and loosing are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, am I twisting the scriptures, or is that what it really says? 
I don't think you can separate those three verses. The three verses are talking about the same crew. If two of you, uh, uh, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. If two of you who are binding and loosing shall agree touching anything that they shall ask, it'll be done of them. It's good to get with binding and loosing, folks, if you want your prayers answered. Amen? Now you say, oh, well, then that means everybody ought to come to Hagwish. No, that means everybody ought to learn how to bind and loose. We have no interest in being the center of anything. We are interested in finding out what God does and then sharing it with every believer who listen to us so they can become a center themselves. Amen? I get tired of these people who have the exclusive truth. You've got to come to us to get it. How about truth that can be shared with the body of Christ so they can do it themselves? Isn't that better? I'd much rather sit down and pray and get a preacher delivered and instructed on how to deliver people and send him back to his own congregation and let him go to work on them than for me to have to go over there. For one thing, it's too slow, it's too hard, and it'll take too long. We'll never get the job done. God's plan is for the truth to be shared among the body of believers and let them learn how to do these things. That's why we print the books. That's why we send out the tapes, the videos, is to help people learn what we've learned. Then they can start where we are and go forward because what, we've, what we're talking about will work. It's been tried and cross-tried and it will definitely work. Angels of God have been sent to locate people that have been lost or contacts been lost with them. I remember a mother had a 16 year old daughter. She came to a deliverance worker. Said, would you pray for my daughter? I don't know whether she's alive or dead. She ran away about six, eight months ago. 16, 17 years old. Haven't heard from her. Don't know whether she's alive. Don't know whether she's dead. And said, would you pray with me? He said, we'll do better than that. He said, Father, would you send an angel Go find that girl if she's alive. Have her call, write, or come see her mother. A week later, the phone rang. And this girl was in California. And the phone rang half a continent away. And she said, Mama, this is so-and-so. Told her where she was, what her phone number was, what her address was. She said, I'm all right. I'm working. Got a job. And she said, but this week, she said, every, all day long and every night, I could hardly go to sleep because I just kept feeling like I have to call Mama. I really ought to call Mama. Just really, I've got to call her. That angel will just nudge, nudge, nudge. Now, if you want somebody to nudge you, send an angel after him. The angel never gets tired of nudging. And he kept nudging that girl for seven days and nights. And finally, she picked up the phone and called Mama. This has been repeated time and time again. You can bind spirits of slowness and dullness and lack of concentration and other things that interfere with children being able to learn in school. And you can lose, you can lose spirits of retentive mind and other things that are listed in the booklet as suggested things of uh, concentration, ability to concentrate, ability to remember, and so forth. You can lose all of those things into your children. You can do this every day, and mothers and fathers who've done this daily have seen children who are making D's and F's come to A's and B's and hold within as little as two weeks. And the kids were not studying anymore. Many times the kids were just breaking their back studying at home, just could never get the stuff. But the praying, the binding and loosing does it. We have, we have cases uh, that we know about where IQs have definitely been changed. I have a letter on my desk, a man who took some civil service tests. He took them and he made low grades. He went back after buy, he'd come here for a workshop. He learned about binding and loosing, started binding and loosing and got some deliverance. And after a deliverance and the binding and loosing, he went back, took them over and he made a tremendously improved grade. I've got a copy of both sets of grades, the ones before and after deliverance and loose. It'll work, people. You see, the thing is, we've got to stop being so lazy and so passive and say, okay, God, hit me with it. You got something? Let me have it. 
Well, you know, you know what you're going to get? Nothing. But God has good things, wonderful things, for those who will cooperate with him. And this binding and loosing is a mighty offensive weapon. And if you don't have one of the warfare prayers and the little binding and loosing booklet, that's an investment I'd advise you to make. Stick it in your Bible, study them, and ask the Lord to show you that, what those mean, and then take you even further. And when you make new discoveries, by all means, let us know. And we'll be glad to share it with other believers. Already we're getting feedback of material that you wouldn't believe that's coming in from other people across the country on various phases of spiritual warfare. This is war. It's all out war. And binding and loosing is one way that we can whip the enemy. It's also a way that in the coming days of crisis that are coming on the world, you and I are going to be able to survive when the world goes under. If we learn how to use our spiritual warfare, our spiritual ammunition, and all of this, we're going to be able to float when the world sinks. Now God's giving us time to get our basic training now. It may be critical in days ahead. We've got time. God is giving us time to learn how to have Jesus as our healer. Because there are going to be times, if the crisis times come that they're predicting, everybody's predicting, we're going to have times when there's going to be no access to any other kind of help except spiritual help. Can Jesus do these things? It'll be a lot easier to pray with faith if you've already seen it work, right? Haven't you noticed that it's easier when you pray for somebody's leg to be lengthened, you see it grow out, you know the next time it's not hard to pray for at all, is it? You look expectantly to it because you've seen it work. You know it works. It's the same thing with, with healing. It's the same thing with binding and loosing. It's the same thing with stopping the enemy attacks against us. So I would encourage you to get your basic training in now. Don't sit around and wait, but rather learn now. You say, oh, well, I plan to do that. You know, I, I've been thinking about it. And uh, several weeks ago, I, I decided, now I've got to get into this thing and get really get, get with it. It could be a daily program. But you haven't done it yet, have you? See, you've got to get cranked up and going. You've got to get with it and stay at it. That's the way it works. It is worthwhile because it will cause the enemy to be blown out of his socks. And isn't that what we want? You can either choose to fight the enemy and whip him or he's going to whip you. You say, well, when I fight him, he whips me anyway. Well, if he's going to whip you anyway, you might as well whip him too. Hmm? The thing is, you see, he's trying to make you give up and just passively take all his blows and, and not strike back. I'm urging you to arm yourself with the weapons of our warfare and get with it so that you can be in the war and that God can use you as a soldier against the enemy. Whatever you bind and loose. He says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. You want people saved? The keys to the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth. Bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loose in heaven. Loose the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption will draw people to Christ draw him up close enough, the Holy Spirit will hit him with conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Pull him right to Jesus. Loose the Spirit. How often do you do it? Do it every day. You know, we've got a lot of these one-timers. You know, oh, I just pray once and it's done. Well, that would be lovely if it worked that way. It just simply doesn't seem to work so good. What I'd like you to see you do is rather than to pray and Speak and have it done. Speak until it's done. I think God's people ought to be persistent enough to outdo the devil. I had a demon one time look at me and very honestly told me, unfortunately I knew it was the truth. He said, Worley, you're pretty stupid. Well, now, if you'd been around, I wouldn't have admitted it. But I told him, I said, yeah, I guess that's right. He said, you don't know a whole lot. I said, that's true. He said, but you are so blankety-blank persistent, and we hate your guts for it. <laughs> well, maybe you're not real smart, and maybe you don't know very much, but if you can be persistent and use what little you know against the enemies, you will win, people. You'll see startling and staggering victories, and you'll be able to pass it on to other people who will also 
be able to win. And won't that make it all? Won't that make it worth everything? It will be worth it all when we see his blessed face. When he calls us for his own, we'll have 10 million happy years to sing of amazing grace. It will be worth it all when we get home. So if it's nothing seem to be worth it right now, take a look ahead at what's coming. And you see, when we get to heaven, one of the things we're going to learn is that everything, everything we've done, everything we've done in this life is counting up and even that, which we don't know about, is going to be revealed. All the battles in the heavens that were won by prayer. All the angels we sent into conflict are carefully numbered. And God will say, why, you shot down the enemy over there that day. Oh, I forgot all about that. Yeah, that was the day you weren't discouraged, remember? Let's stand. If you're here this morning, you've never asked Jesus in your heart, or you're not sure that you have, then by all means, we encourage you to ask the Lord to come in your heart, save you from all your sins. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you don't, uh, you're not sure you have, do it today. If you're having trouble getting it settled and sure, come forward. Tell me or somebody at the front, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you need to do. Somebody will take the Word of God and help you with it. If you're having demonic problems, that means you're being driven, harassed, tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress, you need to have deliverance, evil spirits thrown out. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. And so we encourage you to come and receive help. The whole body goes to work now to minister in Jesus' name for whatever your need is. Uh, another sign that follows believes they shall speak with tongues. If you haven't received your new tongue, then it's a gift. You can have it, and somebody here could help you to understand and to receive it if you're interested. Another sign, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So while we sing something about that name, if you have a need, do come now.